from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Every Sunday morning, after the confession, which if you look carefully, the confession is not part of our service. It actually was supposed to be done on Saturday night before we, but you know, people get busy, you don't want to make two trips, so we just sort of tacked it on to them. So the service really begins Sunday morning after our hymn, and it always starts with this liturgical dialogue. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> grace of Christ, starts the whole thing. That whatever stands between you and God, this gracious presence of Jesus Christ, wipes out, forgives, takes away. So this God now is free to come to you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. When this God comes, he doesn't come to condemn or to judge or to ridicule. But he comes to love and to bring life and words of hope. And this God comes. But then that last piece, and may the communion of the Somehow this word, which Jesus now stops anything from getting to us, so this word now comes, this word now becomes part of us, and now it says, may you commune, literally means with union. May that word continue in your life, and that word in your life be one in such a way that you live as the love of this God here. Today's gospel reading, this doctrine of the Trinity, we start each Sunday morning worship with. This Sunday morning we celebrate it, but it's with this gospel reading from an excerpt of Jesus' farewell discourse. If it sounds familiar, should we've been reading from the farewell discourse for the last four Sundays. And if you don't like it, hang in there, because next week we go back to Luke and that'll be okay. But for this they want us to focus one last time for quite a while on this section. What is Jesus telling us about this God and this relationship we live in with this triune God? In my family of origin, there were four children and we were all two years apart. Now that I have raised children, I marvel at how my mother and father were able to do it. My mother was a school teacher. My father was a pastor. We were all young. There was no microwaves. There was no TV dinners. There were no disposable diapers. Somehow they managed to put it all together. And I grew up believing we were a very close family, which we were. I'm not sure it's because we loved each other, but there was no time and money to get away from each other. So we were <laughs> but there were those occasional moments when mom and dad would go out for an adult evening. I had no idea what that meant. But as they would get ready for a party or whatever it was they were going to, I would remember my mother would begin to put on her best dress. She only had one. Her best dress, and she had a black coat with fur, and she would smell of her perfume. She only brought it out. And Dad would wear his tie, never a collar. He would wear his tie and his suit coat. And as they were, but each time when we would watch that, the four of us would watch in amazement as they would get ready. But we always had three questions. Where are you going? Can we come? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to take care of us while you're gone? Jesus tells his disciples, where are you going? Is it part of this farewell discourse? I'm going to the Father. Can we come someday, but not today? Third question. Who's going to take care of us when you're gone? Closure, as you begin to look around these things, these three questions, those questions still predominate so, or dominate so much of our religious understanding. And you ask people in Oklahoma City today, and I imagine they ask, oh God, where are you? <laughs> Wherever you are, it doesn't seem like you're here with me. And if you're not here with me, why can't I go with you? Why can't the peace and the joy and the fulfillment you talk about be part of my life right now in these shambles? And if that's not possible, well then, who's here to take it? Who's keeping watch of the shop? Because it looks pretty chaotic if you want my own personal opinion. And you don't have to go to Oklahoma City, but within our own lives, with my own life, those three questions dominate so often. God, where are you? Why aren't I with you? Because it sure doesn't feel like it. And if not, who in the world is minding the store? Because it's pretty crazy down here. 
Jesus gives his disciples, he gives us a glimpse. When the spirit of truth comes, the spirit of truth will guide you in all truth. Who's binding the shop? It is this Holy Spirit of truth. John's Gospel uses that word spirit of truth, not just spirit, but spirit of truth 20 times, more than the other three Gospels and all the epistles put together. It's an important concept for John. How does this spirit of truth come into our lives? How do we know it's leading us? We surely need it now. After I graduated from high school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I decided I would go to uh, a school in Wisconsin. I know we have some folks here visiting from Wisconsin. Local Baton Rouge. 1,500 miles away. There were about 1,000 schools in between. But no, I wanted to get go way out there. So I decided I would go 1,500 miles away. And it was interesting. The summer before I left. My father would begin to say, Paul, I need you to go with me on this errand, pick up the Bible. I began to realize in retrospect, he really wanted to spend that time with me in the car because I was a captive audience. There was nowhere I could go. And then we would have these dialogues that would turn into monologues. And he would begin to talk to me about, now you need to know how to manage your money. And you want to be sure you get along with the kids at the dorm. And don't forget your study habits because once you get behind, it's so hard to get. And, one after, and the closer it got to the time of my departure, the more often those trips happened and the longer they became and the slower he drove. <laughs> and it was almost like he was saying, Paul, I love you. And if I give you all the right information, if you got all the right advice, then I know you'll make the right choices. And if you make the right choices, you'll avoid all the pitfalls and you will succeed. And what I want for you is to succeed. The problem is so much of the information he gave me was good, but so much of it was lousy. <laughs> he really made a pitch for me to have a manual typewriter instead of an electronic typewriter because it wouldn't break. <laughs> Nobody has a typewriter anymore. What do you do with that typewriter? And there is this myth. And I think in this information age, we live in this myth. That somehow or another, if we get enough data, if we get the right information, then we'll make the right decisions and we'll avoid the pitfalls. Tell that to the people in Oklahoma. Because many of them were doing all the right things. Going to work, paying their taxes, raising their children, loving their neighbor, and still... The storm comes. And even if we get all the right information, what's to say we make the right decision? We don't. When Jesus promises the disciples, when he promises us that the Holy Spirit, that spirit of truth would come and guide us in the tall truth, he's not promising us more advice or more data. He's not offering us a complete encyclopedia of everything you need to know to live your life. In the New Testament, the word for truth is not scientia. Scientia, where we get science, knowledge of data and stuff. But instead, John uses the word aletheia. Aletheia means a word is given. But the word that is given has the power. The power to say what it is, what it has been, and what it always will be, and it makes it come when we talk about the spirit of truth, it isn't facts and true versus false. As much as the spirit of truth is this spirit of integrity, this word that has been given to you and to me by this God, this word that begins to say you are loved, you are claimed, you are forgiven, you are eternal because you live in me and I will be yours forever. And that word was spoken long ago, it is spoken today, and it will continue to be spoken. And it's in that word that we are led and we are guided. It's that word that is mining the shop and leads us into that life and that love in the good times as well as the bad. When we make the right decisions as well as when we make the wrong. When we feel happy, when we are sad, when the world is chaotic, when things are perfect. It is that word. And that word alone that moves us. The reason I was able to leave home, travel 1,500 miles and live on my own, is not because I had the right information. It is what happened the 18 years before that. There was the love of my parents, and it formed me, and it fed me, and it cared for me, 
and it healed me, and it protected me, and it challenged me, and it promised when you go off, if you fail, this love will not go away. It will be here, and it is your home, and you are safe as long as you're in this love and this home. That's the truth of this Sunday. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Where are you going? To be with my father. Can we come to? Someday. But not today. Who will take care of us? God's word. His spirit. It is here full of love and life. It is all around you. It is in the air you breathe. It was spoken long ago. It is spoken today. And it will continue to be spoken. And it will be the last word. Live in that word. Be guided by that word. It is enough. Amen.